We've been discussing the generalization of the Baskin equation in order to take into account a series of factors that are important in practice. The first of those factors had to do with the mean stress. The second of these factors have to do with multi-axial loading or multi-axial fatigue. Now, when we have multi-axial loading, the idea is going to be essentially quite similar to the path or the uh, template we followed um, in the case of the presence of the mean stress. Um, so when we have multi-axial loading, the stress as a matrix, as a symmetric matrix, will have multiple components that vary over time. Now each component will have its own stress amplitude and mean stress value. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to take those values, so for instance we're going to take for each component the stress amplitudes and put them into a matrix which we're going to call sigma A. Likewise, for each stress value that varies over time, we're going to take the mean values and plug them into a stress, mean stress a matrix indicated um, with sigma M. Now the idea will now be to take these matrices which combine, which, which involve multiple stress components and map each one into a single quantity, which we will call respectively the equivalent stress amplitude and the equivalent mean stress. Okay. Um, and once we have now a equivalent, notice that this is an equivalent normal stress amplitude and it's an equivalent normal mean stress. Once we have those, we're essentially in a setting that we already discussed in the presence of mean stress. So we have just a single normal stress that we're looking at, but it's just that it's not completely reversed, but it has a mean value as well. Well, what do we do? we know that what we need to do is we need to map these into a single completely reverse stress amplitude which we call sigma AR, the equivalent completely reverse stress amplitude. And once we have that X value, then we can predict the life um, of the specimen that we are, or the problem uh, that we are analyzing uh, by making use of the Baskin equation. So notice that the idea is always to fall back to the Baskin equation. The Baskin equation, it says that, well, if you have a completely reverse stress amplitude, then this is how you predict life. Well, this is one dimensional and uh, with a single normal stress. What if you have a mean stress? Well, you use a map that is, for instance, based on the moral relation or the SWT relation. Now we know what to do there, so you take these two, map it into an equivalent value. Now what we are presently saying is if you have actually all components of the stress varying in such a way that each one has its own alternating and mean value, you separate those alternating and mean values into individual matrices and map each matrix into a single equivalent normal stress amplitude and mean stress and then follow the same path towards life. So that is the idea. Um, now, as we do this, we are going to make an assumption that is going to be important and we're going to assume that all components reach minimum and maximum values at the same time. So, for instance, a restriction that comes with this assumption is that the frequency of every one of the components should be the same. And moreover, each component passes through the mean value at the same time. 
So if one is at a max, the other shouldn't be at the min value because then essentially it means that although the frequencies might be the same, the phase of the signals, the individual signals associated or the shapes of the variations associated with every stress component is not exactly the same. So we require that all components reach min and max values at the same time. If this is not satisfied, the situation becomes more complex. Presently, we're confining our attention to this simplification. Now, therefore, the question remains, how do we carry out this map? This is where now we need to do the mapping of a multidimensional stress state to a single equivalent one-dimensional stress state. And we've already seen several of these, of, of such examples when we were discussing failure criteria. And now we are going to take one of those um, ideas and going to apply it here. Now, let us recall actually the expression for the equivalent normal stress associated with the phormesis yield criterion. In that criterion, we would calculate an equivalent normal stress or alternatively equivalent phormesis stress associated with a stress matrix as follows. Well, um, first of all, if we can calculate the principal stresses associated with the stress matrix, then we, what we simply do is we take the differences of the principal stresses square them and then take the square root. So um, why do we have a factor of square root 2? Because suppose there is only sigma 1 non-zero and all the others are actually zero. In that case you will have out of this because these are zero you will have 2 times square root 2 times sigma 1 squared emanating and when I take the square root of that the equivalent expression should be sigma 1 trivially and so we have that scaling factor square root 2. So that's easy to remember. But we also remember that we don't necessarily need to calculate the equivalent stress, the principal stresses. We can work directly with the original stress matrix. And that expression is a bit lengthier. First of all, we have a contribution from the normal stresses that looks similar to the expression associated with the stress no principal stresses, but then we have, because this is not the principal um, stress expression, we have additionally the shear stresses contributing to the equivalent stress. So that is what we had already discussed in the case of the Formesis yield criterion. So this is how one calculates an equivalent Formesis stress. Um, and now the idea is the following. Well, um, we are going to take the components associated with the alternating stresses, this matrix, and we are going to map it to a single equivalent stress amplitude by making use of the equivalent for Mesa stress expression. And in doing so, essentially, we are going to just simply take that expression and add a a to indicate that now this is the equivalent form Mises stress associated with the stress amplitude and the principal stresses are the principal stresses that correspond to the components of that matrix which are sigma xa, sigma ya, sigma za, etc. And of course there can be in general shear stresses as well. So if you calculate the principal stresses associated with that matrix of stresses, of stress components, then those are the principal stresses. Either way, we will reach at the same expression. So that is the proposal to calculate equivalent for Mises stress associated with the stress amplitude. Now we can certainly, and this is definitely a pro pro probability, possibility, uh, we can certainly use the same equivalent for Mises stress in order to calculate the equivalent mean stress. But it turns out that an alternative expression will be presently um, preferred, and that expression simply takes the principal stresses associated with The, prince, the, the mean stress matrix. Okay. So we have the mean stress components as a matrix 
I can calculate the principal stresses associated with that matrix. Those are sigma 1m, sigma 2m, sigma 3m. And that is the proposal, somewhat strange looking at first, but there is again data to support this. That's the way to, to, to map sigma m matrix to a single equivalent normal mean stress. And notice that that expression is simply some of the normal stresses, which we now notice to be nothing but three times the hydrostatic stress. In this case, the hydrostatic stress associated with the mean stress matrix because the hydrostatic stress is some of the stresses divided by three, so that's what we have. And also we will remember uh, from the discussion of the formesis yield criterion that the hydrostatic stress does not really depend on whether you use the principal stresses or the original normal stresses. So you can alternatively directly use the original stress components associated with sigma m, that matrix, to calculate the sum, you'll get exactly the same value. So again, there is data to support that expression as well. So this is the map that we are discussing over here. This is how we map those matrices to single uh, stress entities. Now, um, let us discuss this expression in the ca case of pure torsion. Um, in the case of pure torsion, we could have a stress matrix, just one of the stress components, one of the shear components being non-zero. Um, so the stress could look like zero, let's say tau xy is non-zero and everything else is zero. And of course, it's a symmetric matrix. Um, and therefore, the alternating and mean stress matrices are each going to, they will each have a single entry, namely the corresponding tau xy non-zero, and everything else will be zero. So there will be a tau xi xy um, alternating and a tau xy mean value. Now then, I look at those expressions and try to calculate the equivalent alternating and the equivalent mean stress. The alternating value, well, conveniently, I don't need to calculate the principal stresses. I can directly apply that expression. All the normal stresses are zero. All these shear stresses are zero, except this one, six square root two over that. So I'm just left with a square root three multiplying tau x y a. In fact, it's absolute value. Um, all right, well then, Of course, tau xy a, I can also note here, it's necessarily positive because it's the amplitude, so we don't really need to take the um, absolute value. It is sufficient to keep it in its original form. Uh, but sigma bar m now is going to be simply a sum of the normal stresses, which therefore, in this case, is zero, right? So, which means, therefore, that essentially, no matter what you use, what you're going to find out is that sigma AR is equal to sigma bar A in this scenario, which is equal to square root 3 tau xy A. So in other words, life, which is governed by sigma AR, is influenced only by the alternating shear stress and not by its mean value, because the mean value does not, according to data that supports this expression, does not influence, is not influenced by mean shear stresses. And indeed, when one does experiments, one can observe in some cases that the mean shear stress does not influence life. In other words, it doesn't contribute to the equivalent, um, completely reverse stress amplitude. Now, that is the idea of dealing with multi-axial fatigue. Now, let's proceed and solve a simple example. 